Well, good morning to you. Um, I want to invite you to turn in Scripture to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's on page 959 of the Black Pew Bible that's in front of you, or you can turn in your own copy of God's Word as well. And as we're turning, uh, would you please pray with me as we, be, as we turn to the Lord? Lord, we ask that you would speak again to us by your Spirit, that you would help your Word dwell richly in us so that we can behold the height and depth and breadth and width of your love for us uh, all the more this morning. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> the Christian poet Christina Rossetti wrote a famous poem called Love Came Down at Christmas. And we hear a lot of talk of love like that around Christmas time, but it's really easy for love and talk about love at Christmas to be lost in a lot of sentimental feelings that don't seem to have much shape or definition. Now, we might enjoy the typical hallmark uh, Christmas story. You know the one that goes like an accomplished woman who lives in the big city, um, leaves her stressful, unfulfilling life to return to her small rural hometown where she gets reacquainted and falls in love with the guy she knew from high school who's dressed in flannel uh, and who also happens to be fabulously rich. Um, I, I, there's nothing wrong with feel-good stories like that. I'm not dissing Hallmark movies. Um, but I do want to ask, does that kind of love really define the love of Christmas? No, I think God defines love much more fully than that. And in the first coming of Jesus, He has shown us true love that is stronger and more solid than what our world often thinks about love. This is love that meets and challenges and overcomes the obstacles that destroy love in us and in our world. So let's read from one of the most famous descriptions of love here in 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is God's good news of great joy. Glory to God in the highest. Now, we know, I think, deep down that this description of love is true. This text is often read at weddings, even by people who don't believe much of the Bible, because the truth of this description of love resonates so deeply uh, with us. I mean, who doesn't want to be loved like this? I mean, who doesn't see truth and beauty and goodness when we see love like this in action? <clears throat> but can we really love like this? And can this love actually endure and overcome evil in our world? You might have noticed that many people in our world, sometimes, pe especially people who are skeptical about God, will capitalize words for big, important things that sometimes serve as a kind of alternative to God. People sometimes refer to nature with a capital N or to the universe with a capital U. You might hear things like, nature was so clever to have created this thing, or I'm really hoping that the universe will bless me or reward me. And sometimes people talk about love in the same sort of capital L way as a power that saves. We might hear things like, love conquers all. Love makes the world go around. Love always prevails. Love always finds a way. But is there such a thing as love in a capital L way that has that kind of power? Well, the good news of Advent is that the coming of Christ shows that capital L love has come to us, the ultimate source and the greatest perfection of love in the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. And we can see that God is this 
ultimate capital L love because he meets and he exceeds the definition of love here in 1 Corinthians 13. First, I want us to see that the coming of Jesus shows us that God's love is patient and kind. As Paul writes in verse 4, love is patient and kind. And the season of Advent reminds us that God's love comes to us with patience and with kindness. From the creation to the first coming of Jesus, God had revealed Himself to humanity in numerous ways for many centuries, and yet humanity turned away from God again and again and again to degrade and destroy themselves in sin and misery. And even when God appealed to His people Israel and gave them even greater and clearer revelation of who He was through prophet after prophet, the majority refused to listen and refused to follow, refused to honor Him, just like all the other peoples. Now, when someone who we have loved ignores us, insults us, and walks away from us over and over and over you and I find it very easy to quickly give up trying to love at all. But God's love, God's love is patient. And after all of that rejection, He did not give up. He pursued us again and again with, in fact, the greatest gift of love by coming even nearer to us, by coming to us and being one with us in the humanity of Jesus. And God's love came to us in Jesus also, not only in a patient way, but in a kind way. He moved toward us with a humble, human kind of manner so that we could clearly see and approach Him without fear because His kindness shows us that He can be trusted. And because God's love in Jesus is kind, it does not look or sound at all like the negatives that Paul lists out for us in verses 4 and 5 which are the sinful ways of responding to insult and injustice. Unlike many heroes in our world, God's love in Jesus is not boastful. He is not irritable or resentful in a way that makes Him quick to act in some blaze of anger to defend Himself simply because He's attacked. His love is not arrogant or rude, treating others with contempt and returning insult for insult. And we see here how God's love is the ultimate capital L love because He actually goes far beyond what He even requires from us here. I mean, if anyone has a right to boast, it is the infinite God. It is the Creator of all things, the living Word who upholds all things by His power, the God who is the sum and the source of all goodness and beauty. If God were to declare His own praises, that would not be boasting. And that would not be arrogant because it would be simply true. And it is His right, and it is our greatest good to acknowledge that and to depend on Him. But He came to us in a small and humble place to reveal His hidden glory gradually in acts of love, to win our minds and hearts by His compassion and grace. And even though it is His perfect right to demand that we respect and obey Him, He did not insist on His own way. In the sense that He did not come to us first in Jesus in final judgment to force all of us to submit immediately. He came to live and serve quietly, establishing His kingdom and His salvation and His rule in a small way, in a slow way, like a tiny seed that gradually grows to a huge size. He is a patient God who allows time for us to see, time for us to consider, time for us to work through our caution and our confusion and our stumbling inconsistency, time for us to repent in the fullness of time in our lives as He works all things together to enable us to know Him and to love Him. So, if you fear today that God has given up on you, if turn to Him because His love for you is very, very patient. If you fear God's frustration and fury with you, turn to Him 
because His love for you is kind. Advent shows us that capital L love has in fact come to us in the patience and kindness of Jesus, and there is none greater. Now, there's a second pair of contrasts in these verses that shows us another angle on Advent. The coming of Jesus shows us that God, God's love rejoices in the truth. This is another characteristic of love. Look at verse 6. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Now, in the context of this chapter, Paul is addressing how love works in our relationships with one another, and his point is that love for others requires rejoicing in the goodness in others when they live according to the truth and not rejoicing in what is wrong or evil. Good friends who love you do not encourage you to do what is wrong. Rather, good friends who love you see what is good in you and what good you can do. And they encourage you and help you in doing good so that the good in you, that's potential, can become reality. And in Advent, we see that this is exactly how God loves us. For in the coming of Jesus, God shows us that all of our evil and sin cannot undo the truth that God made us good by making us in His own image. And in spite of the corruption of every aspect of our being, sin cannot extinguish the truth that there is a deep goodness in being a human, me, human being made in the image and likeness of God. And we ultimately know this because in Jesus, God Himself takes on a human nature to display the perfected form of that truth. In Jesus, we see the truth of God's purpose for humanity, for He is the second Adam a new creation uncorrupted. In Jesus, a perfect man is born to live perfectly according to the truth, and heaven and earth rejoice. And again, we see that God's love is the ultimate capital L love because He not merely rejoices in the truth about us, but He is the capital T truth that makes this truth to be true for us. As the Creator he is the source of all truth because He makes all created things to be. And as the Savior, He lives the full truth of being God's image in human form perfectly. And so He can do whatever is needed to deliver us from the darkness of sin's falsehood and lies and corruption. He came to give His life for us in death and to pour His resurrection life into us so that He can restore us by grace to the truth of who we were created to be. So if you think this morning that your life has no worth, if you think that your pain and suffering means that your life is not worth the trouble, if you think that there is nothing about your life that's worth rejoicing about, and fix your eyes on Jesus, the God-man, the human being who shows you in the flesh that God delights in you because He delights in His own image. If you entrust yourself to Christ, if you will believe in the truth revealed in Christ and trust and seek His grace and love to be in you and with you and to change you, then you can know and experience what we hear every week in our liturgy that God rejoices over you as beloved daughters and sons. Advent shows us, capital L, love, has come to us rejoicing in the truth that is Jesus, and there is none greater. Now, the last set of attributes of love here in 1 Corinthians 13 reveals a third aspect of Advent. The coming of Jesus shows us that God's love endures all things. Look at verses 7 and 8. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. In Advent, we look back before Jesus' first coming to remember God's promises to send a Savior King and to remember the way that He has faithfully fulfilled all of those promises. And we see in that Old Testament history a record of love that bears and endures all things. God endured centuries of His own people walking away from Him. 
He bore the sting of betrayal by the people he created and the people that he loved. As Israel broke his covenant again and again, it was to him like the sting of betrayal from his friends. It was like the pain of a spouse being unfaithful with other lovers, as we see in the prophet Hosea. It was like the ache of children rejecting his family and fatherhood to run away, far away, to their own destruction and danger. As he pleads in Isaiah 65 with them, I was ready, he says, to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good. And yet, he bore it all. He endured it all without abandoning his heart of love for his people, without abandoning his good purpose for them. So he came to us in Jesus, not only as evidence that his enduring love never ends, but to bear still more. Christ the man came and bore all the consequences of our sin and evil, all of it, to the dregs, enduring rejection and suffering all the way to the cross without sin and with perfect trust and with perfect love. His suffering for us was not merely a good example of human love, although it was that, but rather the ultimate capital L, love. Because when mere humans love by bearing and enduring hardships with belief and hope, we can only do that by looking beyond ourselves for one who is stronger than we are to help us. We are looking beyond our circumstances for one who is powerful enough to deliver us. We're looking beyond ourselves to a horizon of light and hope to help us in the valley of darkness where we are. But the love that we celebrate in Advent is the coming of the one who is the salvation that we seek outside of ourselves. God is the love who bears us up so that we can bear all things in Him. He is the love who generates belief and hope so that we can believe and hope in Him. He is the love who endures in us and with us so that we can endure all things in Him. So this Advent, cast your anxiety and your griefs and your burdens and your lament onto the strong shoulders of the God who bears all things and endures all things for your sake so that we can love with His hope and His strength in the midst of all that is wrong in us and in our world that is broken. It doesn't matter how long you have stayed away. It does not matter how much wrong you have done. It does not matter how hypocritical or discouraged you may feel. He bears and endures all things for your sake to give you His love again and again forever, so that you will look to Him to receive it again and again forever. That is His glory and delight to do, and it is your greatest good and joy and mine. So I close with a poem, of a, of the portion of a poem called The Divine Image by the 18th century English poet William Blake. I'm not quite sure that Blake meant this poem to refer to Jesus, but his words perhaps express more than he knew or believed because they wonderfully describe the capital L love that is Jesus himself. Here's what Blake wrote. He speaks of virtues all with capital letters. <laughs> to mercy, pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress. And to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. For mercy, pity, peace, and love is God, our Father dear. And mercy, pity, peace, and love is man, his child, and care. For mercy has a human heart, pity a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. Love has come down at Christmas with a human face, in human dress, in Jesus, the human form divine. 
He is capital L, love, the love of God that is God Himself come to draw us into His love. In Jesus, God gives us perfect love that overcomes our repeated sins and failures with perfect patience and kindness. In Jesus, God gives us perfect love that overcomes our darkness and confusion as the perfect truth in whom we can rejoice. In Jesus, God gives us perfect love that overcomes our suffering with His enduring strength. So lift up your hearts and your minds and your hands to receive His unending love again today and every day so that you can find the healing and peace that only His mercy and love can give to you. And pour His love into the lives of others around you as freely as you receive it with patience and kindness, rejoicing in the truth, bearing and enduring all things for His sake by the grace of His love. Would you pray with me? Our Lord, we thank You that Your love for us is this wide and deep and long and strong and never-ending. So we pray, Lord, that You would fill us with this love day after day so that we will be changed, so that we can love You in response and that we can love others in the ways that You have loved us. Do that in us more and more for Your great glory and for our great joy. We pray this in Jesus' strong name. Amen.